Hey guys, what's up? This is Nate from Rooted in Revelation podcast, where we seek to make God's revelation our foundation and all of life. And with us, we have our special guest who this is a second time coming on and we're pretty excited about it. Uh, Jason Hunt, we had him on last time to talk about uh, uh, hermeneutics and his book that he published or his dissertation that became a book. And we talked about that. So if you guys haven't heard that, you should go back and listen before you hear this one um, on the topic of some biblical theology. So without further ado, how are you doing, Jason? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me on again. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course, man. We love to have you. Uh, and love to talk about these topics as well. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Jason, for maybe someone that doesn't know who you are, what's a quick bio that you'd like to yeah. share with the guys? Um, I am currently uh, a pastor at a PCA church in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, but uh, my pathway to getting here it was um, with much variety. I uh, became a believer right when I, when I started college, uh, right before college, and got involved with the campus ministry and ended up going into full-time campus ministry uh, when I graduated. So I was doing parachurch ministry at different college campuses. And uh, then I felt the Lord leading me to pursue uh, seminary education and uh, some sort of teaching role down, down the road. And uh, so I went to seminary, RTS Charlotte, and then got, was involved in church ministry ever since then. So total, I've been in ministry for a little over 20 years, um, probably two thirds of that time in the church and uh, have an interest in uh, theological education as well as pastoral ministry. I love combining those two elements uh, in ministry because I think they do go together. They should go together. And uh, so that's kind of where I'm at now. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. And uh, so, Jason, what's the, what's the, uh, the, t- uh, the topic that we're going to be discussing? Yes. This topic, which is often referred to as biblical theology, um, as we were talking before the show, um, oftentimes is misunderstood. Uh, Biblical theology, the way we're going to talk about it tonight, is a technical term uh, for a branch of theology. Whereas, you know, when people hear that term, they tend to think, well, you know, biblical versus unbiblical theology, and we certainly want to be biblical in the church, Uh, but that's really not what we're talking about. Uh, uh, We're talking about biblical theology as a a branch or a discipline of theology, and I guess just just to start a simple definition, and it's been defined in different ways with different emphases and all of that, but just to keep it simple, I would say what's distinctive about biblical theology is that it looks at what does the Bible say about X through time? So it looks at the historical dimension of, uh, you know, God's revelation. We, we know from the scriptures that uh, he didn't just drop it out of the sky in one split second. It was progressively revealed over time and things developed the story of redemption developed uh, until the coming of Christ and, of course, the consummation at his return. So it's really the timeline emphasis of biblical theology. And what makes that different from, say, systematic theology? Systematic theology asks the question, you know, what does the whole Bible say about any topic X? Um, sort of a, a summary uh, more more um, topically or logically organized rather than a historical emphasis. But all of that said, um, they go together. They complement one another. Uh, they're interrelated with one another. Uh, you can't be doing good theology in any one of those things without the other. So uh, they're to go together in that sense. And um, I guess I'll just share personally my experience with this discipline of theology I was not exposed to it really until I went to seminary and I remember thinking you know this is really important this is 
significant for our understanding of the word and how to apply the word, interpret the word. And why aren't we teaching this in the church? Um, I think people have uh, just a, a sense. Most people have this sense that when they read the scriptures or they hear passages from scripture, they think, you know, I wonder how all this connects. You know, they want to connect the dots, but they haven't been given a framework oftentimes on how to do that. And so that's really sparked my interest um, in this area of theology and doing a lot of reading and, and really trying to round out my teaching uh, of people in the church with this emphasis. Yeah, that's great, Jason. Would you say um, to some degree that biblical theology and say like the maybe last 10, 20 years have kind of gained yeah. some traction, popularity possibly out of the yes, academy? Yes, I have seen, um, if, you, if you look at uh, publication of different books and different series of books, uh, I'll mention some of those later um, in terms of some recommendations for people who want to get started maybe in, in reading in this area. But yeah, there has been a, a renewed emphasis, and I, I welcome that, and I think there's a lot of good resources uh, put out there now. You know, there used to be, I mean, this isn't, technically speaking, this is not a new discipline in the church. This, the church has always been thinking this way from time to time, but uh, oftentimes it gets relegated to academia and a lot of the publications are dense works, they're long works, they're largely inaccessible works in the past on the, the subject of biblical theology. Um, but there's been many good accessible resources being written, so I, I welcome that. Yeah, that's good. So uh, I guess where, where to next? So we kind of, we yeah. find it, or maybe I don't know if um, before you move on, like maybe sure. the audience, like what, what would be an, like maybe an example of a, a biblical theology kind of like, so say term, you know, what's all, you know, the Bible and progressive revelation say about, you know, priesthood or something like that. Do you have like an example you could share just what that kind of looks yeah. like? I'll give you an example just of something I recently taught in a class at our church. I've been teaching through uh, the book of Exodus, and we've just, I just taught on Exodus 14 and 15, which is the actual crossing of the Red Sea, and then the Song of Moses reflecting back on that event. And one of the, you know, that's one of the most well-known events and, and stories and narratives in the scriptures. We teach our kids those things. Um, many people have seen, yeah, they've seen the Ten Commandments movie or whatever they think of when they think of that event. And it's a significant event, but oftentimes people aren't thinking, you know, how does that, is that the, is that a Old Testament story for the Jews or for the Israelites? How does that, besides being an awe-inspiring story, how does that, how's that my story? And so I spent some time talking about how the scriptures themselves use the Exodus event as a paradigm of redemption throughout the scriptures. In fact, it's developed in the prophets and cast forward to, for the people to, people of God to expect a new exodus, an ultimate redemption uh, from slavery to sin through the Messiah and his work. And so I spent some time sort of tracing that out to show them that uh, this, is your, this is our story. The exodus is our story to the point where we come to Revelation 15, and you find uh, in terms of the, uh, the return of Christ, the final judgment, the, the final judgment's just been uh, envisioned in terms of plagues taking place, and the people are standing by, the, by a sea that's completely calm, and it says the people of God are singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Uh, so you have this 
you know, coming full circle to, to its fulfillment. And, you know, as I mentioned in that lesson, uh, the song of Moses and the song of the lamb are not two different songs. Song of the lamb is the song of Moses in terms of its fulfillment in the lamb, in Christ. And so that, that would be one example of uh, tracing things out. And, and there's many interesting corollaries to that connection, that theme of Exodus. Um, one comes to mind in uh, Luke's account of the transfiguration. Uh, in that account, Jesus is transfigured and, and he appears speaking to uh, Moses and Elijah. And it says they were speaking about his departure, Jesus' departure. And the term that's used there is the, the word for exodus. They were speaking of his exodus. So that, you know, is another corroboration of this connection. And uh, there's, there's many interesting uh, aspects to that, that exodus theme. I'll mention one more and then, then we can move on. But um, it's interesting that throughout scripture, um, God is talked about as a divine warrior who defeats his enemies and he pierces the fleeing serpent. Uh, he slays the sea dragon, uh, so to speak. And in the prophets, looking back on the Exodus event, Egypt is referred to as a sea monster or even Leviathan who's in the, in, in the sea or, and uh, in the Nile and that kind of thing and how the Messiah ultimately will uh, pierce that fleeing serpent. So you, you have this divine warrior. God is a man of war in the Song of Moses defeating the Egyptians, but on a grander scale, the Messiah will crush the head of the serpent. Another figure of speech that's used to describe the defeat of Egypt. So you have all of these connections across the canon uh, that you can not only connect it to ourselves today, but to appreciate Christ and his work. Yeah, and I think that's what makes uh, biblical theology such an exciting thing, right? It, it's because, uh, you know, when I was um, like, I'm, I'm, I've recently kind of like you, I, I'm not in seminary or anything, but I've recently started hearing, you know, about all these people like Boss and Glad and Beal and all these guys. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, it's kind of like bands, you know, you know, one band and then, you know, they're the people they kind of play with it. You just kind of, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All the yeah. footnotes and stuff. And sure. And I was like, you know, I never really even understood. Like I always was just kind of, I just stuck in the new Testament because old Testament was like, yeah, I have no clue what's going on in there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it is confusing. Like you're saying, when you don't have a kind of framework to really understand what's going on and, um, but yeah, biblical theology has been uh, eye-opening, you know, when you start seeing, uh, you know, God's meaning in the text and connecting the dots all over the place. And, yeah. and, you, and in a way, uh, you, you see the majesty of style and the beauty and the glory of the word when you start seeing all those things. So I just want to let the listeners know, like if, you know, the, it seems like an intimidating thing, but as Jason's, you know, helping us understand, it's actually something you all can do and you can, you can figure it out and you can see these connections for yourself. And it's, it's really phenomenal stuff. You know, one of the things I, I try to encourage people in the church who, you know, they don't have time to sit down and read some of these, these, uh, you know, significant works in the field. Um, I tell them, get yourself on a reading plan a plan that takes you systematically from Genesis through Revelation, uh, the whole canon, and just do that consistently throughout your Christian life. And you will start to see these connections. You will start to understand uh, the larger context of any one passage. And uh, so, you know, you can do it. It's worth doing, it's worth pursuing. And, you know, I wonder, I don't know what your experience was, um, in terms of being exposed to the scriptures initially when I was a child, um, even though I wasn't a Christian until later, um, 
yeah, I remember going to Sunday school and, and, and uh, having Sunday school lessons and they were very fragmented in my recollection. Uh, you know, you had your story of creation, you had the flood, you had uh, the Exodus um, story of David and, and all of these things. And I never came away thinking um, or understanding how it all fit together. These are interesting, entertaining stories. Maybe we have some moralisms that we draw from them, but being disconnected, uh, you don't see how they're connected to Christ and, and his work and what that means for us. So there, it does affect our interpretation and application. So. Yeah, that's really helpful. And that's exactly like you just brought it up the kind of, oh, be, be like David or be like, right. you know, it, it, we look at the Old Testament narratives and, and kind of picture ourselves like, oh, the, they're like the heroes and they demonstrate for us some kind of allegorical, you know, right. how we, we can be like them if we do the same things. And, you know, a lot of that stuff, pretty popular um, in some circles, uh, those kind of ideas. But <clears throat> it's super helpful when you actually oh, this, you know, the Old Testament's not really about me. It's actually about <laughs> Christ, right? right? And, and, uh, and, and, you know, just to follow up on that, um, you know, we do get some encouragement to imitate the faith of some of those who've gone before us, like Hebrews 11 and, and other things. But, um, you know, largely uh, all of those Old Testament heroes have significant flaws, and you're left with, okay, yeah, what do I imitate and what do I not imitate? Um, you know, and, and you run into some roadblocks in terms of making sense of how you're supposed to respond to a character. If, if you're pursuing a moralism emphasis, uh, do this or don't do that. Um, and then again, you, you miss Christ in that. You miss the gospel in that. Right. And of course, yeah. Of course, we don't want to say don't be moral, right? right <laughs> of right. course, there's there's still good things, right? Yeah, sure, sure. But yeah, so yeah, we can carry on to your next next part. Yeah, um, I guess before I move on to okay, we talked about you know what is it basically um, before I get to why why I feel like it's important in a number of levels. Um, there has been some debate over you know how how do you organize biblical theology? What, what do you emphasize? Because, you know, which theme or themes uh, are the, the ones that, that sort of summarize the biblical uh, corpus, you know, and, and there's been different, I just want to acknowledge there's been different uh, takes on that. Um, some of the big themes that have often been used to organize uh, or to look at the Bible historically are covenant, and kingdom, kingdom of God. Those two themes, you know, largely overarching themes that have been used. Um, also, uh, Vern Poitras, I don't know if you had him on here yet, but uh, he, uh, Not he yet. wrote a book called Symphonic Theology. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that book, but uh, it's a very helpful book about uh, doing theology and understanding uh, multiple perspectives when it comes to doing theology. And in there, he talks about multiple perspectives or thematic approaches to the scriptures are needed because we are finite. Not because you pit certain perspectives against another or you deny objective truth or anything like that. That's not his point. His point is not anti-objective truth, but rather an appreciation for the fullness and the variety of that truth. Um, only God has the sort of the blueprint of all what's in the scripture that he's revealed. So it's helpful to look at it from different perspectives, different themes, because we um, discover blind spots in our theology and we discover things we didn't know before about Christ and his work. And I often use the illustration in terms of the helpfulness of this approach. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, I don't know if people play board games or anything like that anymore, but uh, you've ever played Boggle? Do you know what Boggle is? I don't. Okay. 
<laughs> well, maybe some of our listeners will, but basically it's, it's a word game. Okay. So you got, um, you got this container with these little dice in it with letters on them and you shake it up and you put it down and they kind of fall into place in this little grid. And then you have so much time to identify words that are either appear horizontal, vertical, or diagonal, or backwards, you know, as the letters lay. And the person that comes up with the most words wins. And when you play that game, sometimes you're, you're, you get stuck by looking at the board from a certain way. And I've even asked in the middle of the game, can we switch the board? So I'll just turn it one one half turn and all of a sudden words start appearing to me that I didn't see before because you're looking at it from a different angle, different perspective. And in the same way that can be true in biblical theology, uh, you look at different themes, you see different things, you appreciate different things. And uh, I know GK Beale, you mentioned his name earlier, in his New Testament theology, he talks about his approach being a, a storyline approach, which, you know, look, trying to identify what's the main storyline from the old into the new, which carries with it a number of different themes. So he's looking at it a multiple theme approach as well. And as I always say, you know, you trace any theme through the scriptures and you're going to trace the gospel. And you're going to trace Christ and you're going to see him in different ways in all his fullness. So that's kind of just to put a cap on, you know, what is biblical theology? Um, now I just want to move on to, okay, why is that important? It's all very interesting. And, you know, uh, to see the sort of the literary connections across the canon and all of that. Why is it important? Well, um, I think there's there's an important place for emphasizing history uh, today. Uh, obviously, the scriptures are thoroughly historical. There's no inherent opposition between theology and history. Uh, our theology is historical. Uh, there's the incarnation. Uh, we have that even embedded, the historical uh, particulars embedded into things like the Apostles' Creed. You know, why would you mention suffered under Pontius Pilate, you know, in a creed, you know, a historical particular? Well, history is, is essential to our faith, uh, what Christ has accomplished in time, space, history. So a historical look at the word is, is important, and you see a lot of anti-historical sentiments in our culture today, suspect of history, you know, suspicious of it, what's its real value and all of that. So this is another way of emphasizing that. Um, I think also, um, as I said earlier, um, this is the gap. In my opinion, this is the gap in the church's understanding, you know, from my experience uh, on the ground, the gap in people's knowledge. They may know some things about particular texts, specifics about exegesis. They may know some theological points, maybe it's the five points of Calvinism, maybe it's, you know, who Christ is, the Trinity, things like this. But the missing gap there in between those is biblical theology. And um, this can lead to a lot of problems. One is a disregard for context. You know, context is key in interpretation, but not just at the micro level. There's the canon level of context that needs to be appreciated also, which if you leave that out, you expose yourself to heresy, just like any other uh, non-contextual approach to the scriptures. I think also you mentioned it uh, in passing you know, without biblical theology, there's, there's an avoidance oftentimes of the Old Testament because we don't know what to do with it, you know. Maybe certain parts we do. Um, maybe we like the Psalms because they connect with us emotionally. You know, we like the Proverbs because they're you know, wisdom principles or whatever. But, you know, what do you do with some of these narratives? What do you do with some of the stranger events and, and laws and things like that? 
if you don't have that larger context, you're, you're probably just going to either make up something, make up a, a moralistic uh, lesson out of it, or you're just going to ignore it. So that's another problem of, you know, another reason why it's important to address it. And I think another thing I would add to more on the negative side is without an understanding of biblical theology, you can take those, uh, those fragmented texts that you know about, and you can start drawing lines to connect those dots in ways that the scriptures do not. And you end up creating a different story. I'll give you an example of this. Um, this often, I think, happens with eschatology or end times um, stories that are, are put together. And there's not a, a sense of continuity or development. There's just these separate texts. And it's almost as if an outside story is being imposed upon the scriptures, some artificial connections, taking things out of context where you create a, a narrative of the future, so to speak, that does not match what the scriptures are actually saying. And another way to put it, you know, not necessarily with the end times thing, but, you know, you give man fragmented texts without a context and, and they'll come up with a story that's all about them. <laughs> It'll be a man centered story. You know, if you're functioning in that in that way so i think it's very important for those reasons and some more that i'll mention and feel free to stop me at any time if you have you want to interject a question um i go back to in terms of interpretation it's important for interpretation christ if you remember on the road to emmaus appears to his disciples luke 24 and in that chapter, he ends up showing them how all of the scriptures spoke of him. Of course, he's largely talking about the Old Testament scriptures there, but obviously the New Testament scriptures speak of him in light of his coming and his and looking forward to his second coming. So he gives Christ gives his hermeneutic for the scripture. Maybe we wish he'd give us more details. But he basically says, you are doing the right thing if you look for me in all of the scriptures. So he points to a unity there. Um, I would also argue to say he really didn't leave us in the dark about what that method looks like, because I think you find on the pages of the New Testament, um, examples of things he taught his disciples, of things that he taught his disciples after his resurrection, before his ascension, about the kingdom of God, what the, what the, the apostles wrote in the New Testament, reflect all of that. So in a real sense, I think we do get a window into what he told them. So that, that's an important aspect, which is a big part of biblical theology seeing Christ, seeing the unity of the scriptures in that sense. We also see it through the New Testament use of the Old Testament. How do New Testament authors um, interpret and use and apply Old Testament texts to their, uh, their stage in the story? And, you know, there's a lot of interesting things you see and how they handle those texts. But just off the bat, one practical consideration is, you know, they, they were applying Old Testament texts to the time between the comings, even in the first century. Well, we live, even in our century, we live in the time between the comings. So in a sense, we live in the same stage of redemption they did. So there's going to be a lot of overlap in terms of, even though there's historical distance there, there's a lot of overlap in how the New Testament authors are applying the text to the church of their day, <clears throat> and it'll connect with us as well. Um, another aspect of how they handle the Old Testament is that they 
they appreciate the context. Um, I think Beale in his New Testament theology, he cites uh, the scholar C.H. Dodd, who wrote a book called According to the Scriptures back in the 50s, I believe, early 50s or 40s. And he makes the point in there that when when the New Testament authors draw from the Old Testament, they don't just cherry pick verses as sort of artificial proof texts. Even though they only cite one passage, they show and how they're using it that they're appreciating the substructure of that Old Testament text. So they're, they are deeply contextual, even if on the surface it doesn't appear that way. Um, I would also say um, the New Testament authors realize that they are living in the time of fulfillment. So if you think of the story, the you know, Old Testament pointing to Christ and his coming, the fulfillment of all things, the Old Testament looked for the time of fulfillment. Well, when, the, when Christ comes, it becomes quickly clear that the the fulfillment will happen in two stages, his first coming and second coming. So one big aspect for interpretation and understanding the, the larger story of scripture is the now not yet fulfillment. Um, many authors in the field of biblical theology have pointed this out in various ways. Um, we have, we live in a time of now not yet. We're, we're, raised with Christ now, but we will be raised. You know, we, we have spirit, all the spiritual blessings uh, in Christ. All the promises are yes and amen in him, yet their fullness will be experienced in the consummation at his return. So that, that's part of the story. And that really affects how we interpret texts. Um, I would also say that... Uh, you know, scripture, speaking of hermeneutics and interpretation, scripture is, is self-interpreting. It has a built-in hermeneutic. And we're trying to submit our hermeneutic to that. It's not up to us to put the pieces together. You know, it's not as if the Lord just scattered some truths down uh, and revealing them to people, and then it's up to us now to put the pieces together to make the puzzle fit. Um, it's already pre-interpreted by God. It's already has its own inner hermeneutic, which points to the fact that it's self-interpreting. You know, we interpret scripture with scripture. That all fits together. And I think biblical theology is a way of looking at how scripture interprets scripture. It's, it's sort of unpacking that um, and how that looks. Um, I would also say in terms of application, another illustration I use to explain this is, um, I don't know if people still go to malls anymore, but I grew up in the, in the era of the mall, you know, back in the 80s. That was the, the height of the, the mall culture. And, you know, when you walk into a mall, one of the first things you see is that sort of triangular map thing. <laughs> and you find where the stores are and, and it'll give you the X where you are in the building and how to get from here to there. And that's exactly what biblical theology gives us in terms of the story, the stages of redemption, the unfolding of it. It shows us where we are. And it shows us how others can get to where we are and how we can get to them. And in the ways that are appropriate to the scriptures themselves. So it's very practical in terms of application. It goes back to that question that, you know, we talked about earlier. You know, what do you do when you come across, um, you know, the Old Testament law? the ceremonial laws and things like that. How do you get from there to here, you know, in terms of application and you know, what's appropriate? So, um, you know, having that larger grid, that larger map really helps us to do that. 
So yeah, those, that's, those, that's good. Those are some of the things I feel like are important. The interpretation side of it, the application side, and there's another I'll mention uh, as well as we go along, but uh, did you have any uh, follow-up questions to that or? Yeah, let me see if I can remember sure. one or two of them. Okay, so like when you were talking about, um, you know, and, and as far as biblical theology and hermeneutics interpretation go, you talked about it's important to interpret scripture with scripture. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering, like, contra that, I, I, I'm i often, I think about, well, your book, for example, talks a lot about surveying the field. And we talked about that. I don't want to go too deep into it, but just the idea of, when, when, uh, like a lot of scholars and academics, right. They, they'll take uh, biblical theology or something like that, but then they'll read kind of like the li- linguistics and kind of the culture and the background of the time. And then kind of use that as their philosophical methodology kind yeah. of grid work. And then it ends up, I, I think, uh, people like Peter ends, for example, they, it ends up becoming, like his book was it uh, incarnation and inspiration. Uh, yes, yeah. and um, he kind of points out, oh, look how human this is. It's just right. like the, the culture, and they're all using the same sources. And uh, yes. you know, so what would uh, how how do we think through those kind of objections possibly? When people, yeah, say, that's a great great yeah. question because I, like I, I always wondered gonna... like what the balance is between uh, well, how much culture do we let in, and then how much scripture interpret scripture do we let in is that all of this that or a little of that you know what i mean right, how right. that like pans out for people yeah it, it raises some presuppositional issues um that you know if we go back to the the initial uh popularity of the discipline of biblical theology it was largely critical um and i'm talking uh, around the time of the enlightenment and shortly thereafter, the discipline of biblical theology was really becoming coming into its own, but in a negative sense, largely in academic circles, because it, it assumed certain things. It assumed uh, man's autonomy, his you know, the sort of the rationalistic approach. It also assumed things about historical development that would run contrary to the presuppositions in scripture. Namely, um, it looked oftentimes at the evolution of religion. That whatever development um, that we see in the scriptures, it, it it's a development from something that's infantile to something that's mature um, in terms of, you know, comparative religion, you know, it started off as sort of a pagan-like thing that's similar to others, and then it developed over time. Well, it, that really denies the the truth of uh, revelation from the get-go. It sort of assumes it's not revelation. It's just man's subjective religious experience that evolves over time. And that became the subject of the historical look at the scriptures. Another uh, anti-biblical presupposition that uh, influenced those critical approaches in biblical theology was that um, there was almost a, uh, a metaphysical agnosticism. You know, there's, there's a focus on history. History is something we can scientifically, you know, look at and analyze, but, you know, theology and history really don't go together. Theology is sort of, you know, these stories about things we really don't know anything about. So there becomes a a pitting of the two against one another in these critical approaches, whereas what was a breath of fresh air to the field uh, was somebody like your hardest boss um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, taught at Princeton Seminary, and he chaired the, the the department of biblical theology and he um in a very well written uh well it's an essay but it was actually given as a, an address um uh, inaugural address of that position um he talks about what is the biblical idea of biblical theology as opposed to the way it's been distorted 
and again, he's he's summarizing things and 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 uh, saying things in perhaps new ways, but he acknowledges the Reformed tradition has acknowledged biblical theology all the way through, whether they called it that or not. You know, there's if you even look at the Westminster Standards, you know, which is sometimes thought of as solely a systematic systematic theology you know what is who is christ what is god and all of that um but in there you have you know the covenants which unfold over time it has a very um biblical theological understanding of the law um as well as the kingdom of god the offices of christ all of these are biblical theological categories oftentimes so um so I, to answer your question, I, I think it, it goes back to some of those presuppositional issues. And, you know, in these methods, are they, are they getting these ideas from the scriptures or from outside and imposing them on? And, you know, so, some of those being, as I said, uh, you know, pitting theology against history, uh, pitting revelation against history. Uh, all of these types of things, which are just not the case when you read the scriptures. Right. Yeah. There's no inherent tensions there. Yeah. And I think in your, your book that we talked about last time, you, or I think so, but I'm sure you're, you're aware of the kind of, you know, there's definitely a, a kind of a guild that wanted to say, okay, let's free ourselves from these deductive systems, like starting with the character of God and like a prolegama, and then let that allow to, that be our grid for how we understand scripture and the word of God. And they're like, Oh, we got to free ourselves of all these biases and we got to get into being more inductive with it. Not that they're necessarily in conflict. I think we would both acknowledge that, you know, of course you do inductive, but you do have some deductive aspects to your, you know, your presuppositions of how you're going forward. But I I think of people like Carl Bart and a lot of these other guys, or just, liberal scholarship as it developed was kind of like, oh, we don't, we don't want to impose any systems. We want to get as objective and close to what's really going on um, right. and, and not be, you know, have some Presbyterian bias or some, you know, and, and that, and right. it seems to be like a repetitive thing that kind of, you know, happens every with this kind of cycles like conservative liberal conservative liberal back and forth on the authority of the scripture and how we view right. methodology so i just always thought that was very interesting yeah 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 so yeah i'll let you move on i think that's all the questions okay. i have for yeah, now yeah. yeah the other thing i was gonna i find this interesting about uh you know looking at the scriptures this way um we see examples of how uh, even Christ himself deals with the scriptures in this way. And this brings to the, you know, I mentioned the importance of biblical theology for interpretation, application, but also the spiritual battle that we're in. It's practical on that level as well. Um, You know, Christ, if you remember when he is being tempted in the wilderness, and Satan, one of his temptations is actually with the scripture, Psalm 91. And so he tempts him with this scripture. How does Christ respond? Well, he basically interprets scripture with scripture to say to Satan, you can't, that text cannot say this because of these other texts. So he's, Christ himself is, is using this principle, which assumes um, this unity of the scriptures as continuity. And um, there's a number of interesting elements um, in that encounter. I was going to uh, point out a few of those. He, uh, first of all, in Psalm 91, where it's being quoted. Uh, That's actually a psalm of confidence. A psalm of confidence in the fact that the Lord will care for his people. 
But you remember the temptation was sort of presented in a way that Jesus tempting him to start from a place of uh, unbelief, that you had to prove that God would care for his people. So even the very use of that is out of order with the psalm as a whole. But what's interesting is the verse right after, the verses that are quoted by Satan, says that God will make his people trample the serpent underfoot. Which is interesting that uh, within that very psalm that Satan, the serpent, uses has uh, uh, a signal of his demise, even in the context of the psalm. But that's the narrow context. Well, what about the larger canonical context? Well, as I said, he, Jesus responds with uh, a quote from Deuteronomy 6 in, in uh, responding. So he's interpreting scripture with scripture, and he does this with each one of these things, largely from the book of Deuteronomy. And it evokes all kinds of connections between Christ as the representative of the people of Israel. Their testing in the wilderness, which they failed largely, his testing in the wilderness where he succeeds. So there's a lot of biblical theological connections in terms of his representation and his uh, active obedience uh, in their place. And uh, so that, that's one example of um, you know, Christ himself using these, this approach or at least it's assumed that he's using that approach, even if he's not you know, laying it out in those same terms. Um, and then another thing I would say about the spiritual battle that we're in, I, I believe the enemy, we know that throughout the history of the church, he, his, one of his main tactics with the scriptures is to decontextualize passages. To, that's what the heretics have done down through the centuries. Pit one text against another or take one out and make that central and, and, and put down other texts that would actually refine that and speak to it. So that's always been a tactic. Now, what I find with the storyline of Scripture, that, uh, you know, Christ is the center of the biblical story and how it's all fitting together. Uh, it all centers upon the person and work of Christ, his first and second coming. If Satan can get the church to fragment the Bible, to lose the sense of story, we lose the center. Christ disappears. And I think that's very much a part of the spiritual battle and what you see sometimes in, in popular preaching or, you know, things that you would see maybe on TV or whatever. Um, you know, Christ is really nowhere in there. Um, he may be a tag on the end, but it really doesn't make any sense. Um, it, the text is being handled in a fragmented way where there really is no story. These are timeless sort of principles or, or platitudes, you know that you just say to people and then you make it fit, you know, whether uh, they can expect to have a, a windfall, financial windfall or whatever. But, you know, it, you lose the story, you lose the center. And I think that's exactly what the enemy wants. And I think biblical theology, giving attention to it is going to guard against that in the church. Yeah, I think that's huge, Jason, because, you know, like you mentioned a few times, just uh, like the, the, the context of not just, you know, of course, we're doing context exegetically, you know, on a text basis, but also zooming out and saying, okay, what's the larger context of the story unfolding? And I think that's, where I see a lot of like things go wrong with so, so many things that do end up going wrong. You know what I mean? You lose yeah. that bigger story. And like you're saying, you can kind of make it say a little bit of anything, you know? Yeah. Um, Another example I thought of um, from Galatians three, this is just an example of 
the problem of taking things out of uh, redemptive historical context or a canon context is when when um, Paul is basically addressing the errors of those who would say that the covenant promise um, to Abraham comes to us of the first century <laughs> of Paul's audience apart from Christ. That uh, the promise comes through the law apart from Christ. That's, that's a redemptive historical or a biblical theological error. And he actually spends time correcting that with the larger story. That's in Galatians 3. Just another example of even within the scriptures themselves, this approach being used. Yeah, because Paul brings Abraham up and Sarah and Hagar, right? Talks yeah. about the children and yeah. Yeah. So the, I think there's, you know, a whole host of practical implications of this particular discipline that I think is too often neglected. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. And and I'm hoping that, you know, this will be super helpful for the people listening, right? And 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 seeing the importance of this and and how foundational this is to not only understand who Christ is and his his beauty and glory all throughout the pages of scripture, but also yeah. to guard us against, you know, heresy, to guard us against wrong doctrine, false doctrine. It, it's so foundational to to know your Bible well, you know? Yeah. So, and there's really no shortcuts to do, to do it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's why I just encourage people to, to be reading through all of the scriptures. I encourage ministers, teachers of the word to try to avoid uh, favorite portions of the canon to the neglect of others. Have a system, have a, an approach where you're exposing your whole, you know, your people to the whole counsel of God, as, as Paul says in Acts 20, you know, to the Ephesian elders, you know, I didn't shrink back from teaching you the whole counsel of God. Um, it's important. And, and what, you know, I've often thought what a tragedy it would be to come to the end of your life or the end of your ministry and um, either for yourself or for your people, you know, I never really read all of what God revealed to us. I think that what, what a tragedy that would be when it's, when it's very doable in this life to, to be exposed to the whole council. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know too, like if uh, I know maybe a few pastors may listen and say, and uh, they're wondering, well, how do I incorporate, you know, biblical theology into my preaching? What, what advice yeah. or what kind of helpful things would you recommend for people that may be preaching and teaching. Yeah, I would, um, I would, you know, a couple recommended uh, books to read, uh, things to be exposed to that I think would be helpful to sort of round out your understanding of the scriptures. Um, probably the simplest lay level book out there that I know of is called God's Big Picture by Vaughn Roberts. Uh, it's about I don't know, maybe 130, 140 pages. Uh, and it's very practical. It's actually laid out in a study sort of way where you could go in a small group and you go through it. It's got study questions and stuff. And it takes you through the storyline. And it's largely based on uh, older work by Graham Goldsworthy called Gospel and Kingdom. So the theme that's the organizing theme that they're using in that is the kingdom of God. Um, so that's a good one. Another good one is Far as the Curse is Found by Michael Williams. And that one kind of looks at it more in terms of covenant, but it brings in other themes as well. And it's, it's, it's well done. It's well written. Um, there's a book called Christ of the Covenants by O. Palmer Robertson. So as the title suggests, it's looking at the story through the successive covenants, the economy of the covenants and the fulfillment in the new covenant. So it's looking at it that way. Um, there's a number of things and, and I can send you a, a list that I've made if you wanted to post it with it. Um, those are kind of the more introductory level works. Uh, there's a lot of other ones that are more academic but are very good as well. Um, there's some great series 
that have come out, as I said earlier, one's called a new, new Studies in Biblical Theology, edited by D.A. Carson. There's a number of volumes in that, that series now. Really interesting stuff, looking at different themes that are traced through the scriptures. And then there's another one called Essential Studies in Biblical Theology. This is one that uh, I think it's edited by Benjamin Glad. Um, and there's, I don't know how many are in that series, but there's a number of those as well. <clears throat> and maybe, maybe a good place to start for a lot of people for a reference work on the pastor's shelf is the New Dictionary of Biblical Theology put out by InterVarsity Press. It's edited by Goldsworthy um, and others. And it's a great resource because the first half of it looks at each book of the Bible and looks at themes in each book. And then the second half of the dictionary is those particular themes traced on through. And so it's a very helpful sort of cliff note resource um, for these issues. But as far as like, you know, practical advice, um, I would just look at it as, okay, this isn't something to bog down my lesson or bog down my sermon, but this is something to help me apply the scriptures to my audience. Um, Cause if you, in my experience, if you see how a text especially in Old Testament text, connects with Christ, how that text is fulfilled in Christ, then you have a, a better window into how it applies to us today. Because that's really the order in which we go. We don't draw a straight line from the Old Testament to us that bypasses Christ and his work. We go through the fulfillment and then to us. And that's makes, you know, I think that's probably the, for most people coming out of seminary who are preaching or teaching, um, the focus in their preparation is the academic side. You know, what does this text mean and all of that? And oftentimes what gets neglected is applying the text. Or we don't spend much time working that out. And I think biblical theology will help you to be practical. It's not just an academic exercise, but it'll help you be practical with your application. Um, and connect with your audience in that way. So th those are a few thoughts initially. That's great, Jason. And I guess the question of, you know, when you get into a text, you're teaching through a book, think of the second level of context. Don't just think the context of the chapter or the book, but the story. Mm. Yeah, that's great, Jason. And so we're at about 7.03, so... Uh, yeah. Did you have any final uh, encouragements, uh, thoughts you wanted to share, anything, any other rants you'd like to go on or anything else <laughs> <laughs> that you would have? Um, I mean that in a positive way, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I won't air my grievances. So <laughs> yeah. here, but uh, no, I, I would just say I found this, pursuing this field of study, and, and I fully embrace all the other disciplines, you know, biblical disciplines of, of theology, systematics. That was probably my introduction to um, a lot of my interest in theology in general is through systematic theology. And all of that has its place and it's important. But because I had not had a real strong foundation of biblical theology, um, I've probably spent more time reading in that area since. And I find it personally very exciting and very um, interesting uh, because you, you see the beauty of Christ. You know, if, uh, if you think of a, a, a perfect diamond with all its facets and you, you hold it up to the light and you see the light refracting through and shining through and reflecting off and all of that, uh, you, you appreciate its beauty. And I think that's, in the end, that's what, what you see when you look at the scriptures this way. You, you appreciate the beauty of Christ and all his uh, perfections and sufficiency uh, for us as sinners. And it's really ends in worship.
that's where it should end. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm, I thanks so much for this, Jason. That's been a yeah. privilege uh, as always, and we'll probably do it again, Lord willing. And um, sure. it's well, always, thank you. I appreciate always, you having yeah. me on. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jason. And uh, so if, if you guys, uh, I will definitely post all the things that you mentioned. I typed them out on my phone. So I got those. I'll put them in the recommended uh, in the description below, if it's on YouTube or if it's on anchor or Spotify uh, or Apple, I'll make sure it's all in there as well. Okay. And um, yeah. So thanks so much, Jason. And uh, until next time, this is rooted in revelation podcast, where we seek to make God's revelation, our foundation, all life. Till next time, God bless.